As part of our 10th anniversary, we're looking back at some of the exceptional events and people we've covered. Next, from November 2003, we show our one-on-one -on -one interview with then-State Senator Barack Obama as he was seeking the nomination for the U.S. Senate. At the time of this interview, State Senator Obama was not expected to win the nomination. Of course, he went on to win election to the U.S. Senate in November of 2004 and was elected the next President of the United States in November of 2008. This runs about 30 minutes. Senator Barack Obama, thank you for joining us on the Illinois Channel. Great to be here. Let's just start, um, I always like to start with a big question, why should you be the next Senator from Illinois? Well, you know, I've spent my entire adult life, I think, working on the issues that uh, Illinois voters are concerned about. You know, I, I uh, was a community organizer out of college and, and worked with church-based organizations in uh, the far south side of Chicago, areas that have been devastated by uh, steel plant closings and helped set up job training programs and education programs in the area. Uh, I've been a civil rights attorney. I teach constitutional law at the University of Chicago. Uh, and over the last seven years, uh, I've worked in the state senate uh, on health care issues, on jobs issues, on education issues. Uh, and so I think I bring an enormous amount of uh, experience uh, to the table uh, and a great passion for uh, giving ordinary citizens, uh, I think, an opportunity uh, to succeed in uh, uh, this society. And so the United States Senate, I think, is uh, just one more step, another progression in a career that has been devoted to public service. When you look at the issues, and there's any number that we could discuss at length, but right. are there top issues in your mind that are the highest priorities that you want to really focus on? If well, you know, I think that the country is at a crossroads right now. Uh, I think it's at a crossroads domestically and internationally. Uh, I think on the international front, we've got an administration who's uh, arrogance, I think, has been unbounded, and uh, that's been on display, not just in Iraq, but on a whole host of other issues. Uh, the Kyoto Protocol dealing with greenhouse gases, uh, the International Criminal Court that could have brought uh, uh, war criminals like Milosevic or Saddam Hussein uh, or Charles Taylor to justice. Uh, and as a consequence of that arrogance, I think that we have systematically reduced the effectiveness of international rules, norms, institutions, and that's made us less secure. And I think that's on exhibit right now in Iraq. I was proud that a year ago I indicated that this war was a bad idea, uh, not because I doubted the brutality of the uh, Saddam Hussein regime, but I felt that the threat was not imminent and that we should focus on al-Qaeda and the war on terrorism, which had to be our number one priority. I think that lack of focus uh, is now costing hundreds of billions of dollars, and I think the troops are going to continue to experience the kind of difficulties that they've experienced over the last uh, several months. Uh, that has a direct impact on the domestic side because uh, that $87 billion could have been spent uh, in investing in roads and bridges and hospitals and infrastructure right here in Illinois. And I think when you travel around the state over uh, a year or year and a half, what you discover is the enormous decency of the American people, but also the fact that people are hurting. Uh, job loss is chronic across the state, especially in the manufacturing area. And I think uh, the health care crisis has continued to worsen over time. And so without our ability to make good choices internationally and domestically, uh, without our ability to reprioritize uh, how we spend our federal dollars, I think we're going to continue to have problems. Let's talk about Iraq for a, a bit. <clears throat> now that we are there, would you stay? I think we have no choice, unfortunately, but to stay for uh, some period of time. Uh, I've indicated that uh, I was opposed to the war at the outset, uh, but I do think that if we removed our troops immediately, you would see an enormous power vacuum and chaos in an uh, area that's already, already uh, destabilized. What I do think, though, is that we have to internationalize that process to minimize the threat to our troops and the costs to taxpayers. Now let me just interject there. Sure. They just uh, was the donors forum in Spain mm -hmm. in an effort one would think to to do just that, to internationalize right. it. We do have some Polish troops and other uh, international troops serving there. Yeah. Well, how can you internationalize more if you have the countries uh, such as Spain, uh, France and Germany rather, uh, who are just not going to go along? Well, I think there are a couple of things that we could do. 
uh, part of the reluctance, I think, for donor nations to contribute to the process is that the Americans have not invited them in into the key decision-making processes that are going in rebuilding Iraq. I mean, the authority in Iraq is essentially the American government. Uh, and we have not invited those other countries to participate in the politics of creating a stable democratic Iraq. You would make it more as we did, say, with Germany after the Second World War, where Absolutely. you had zones of influence. Absolutely, and I think that is a great example of how we were able to attract significant investment. The other thing that we have to do is, I think, uh, eliminate some of the no-bid practices and patronage that are going into the rebuilding process. I mean, when you have companies like Halliburton or Bechtel who are able to uh, engage in the rebuilding process without competition, then other countries like France and Germany, understandably, are going to be reluctant to have their taxpayer dollars uh, going to American companies unilaterally. And so I think that there are a number of areas that we can engage other countries to participate. Uh, and I think that we also have to have a clear exit strategy that involves tr uh, retraining, re-engaging uh, Iraqis to defend themselves. And that's something that we've been slow on doing. What do you think about the policy that the Bush administration had of uh, preeminent, or, or preemptive, I should say, military strike? Right. Well, I, I think in theory, uh, there may be conditions in which the, uh, the threat to our security is so imminent and so well documented that we would try to take out uh, that threat before it actually occurred. This was not one of those situations. Uh, we didn't, never had the sort of documentation or proof that Iraq was an imminent threat uh, to the United States and our security. Uh, I think in general what we have to recognize is that there are uh, limits to the degree that we can engage in nation building and manage uh, world hotspots. Uh, we don't have unlimited resources, and we don't have unlimited troops. We have the most powerful military uh, in the history of the world and we should maintain our military strength. But we also have to recognize that that military strength should be primarily deployed to direct threats to our interests. And when we start engaging in practices in which we're going into countries trying to rebuild them, we are now changing the mission uh, uh, of our military and we have not trained our troops to engage in day-to-day -day policing, rebuilding, reconstruction. Those are enormous efforts and those are efforts that have to be done on an international basis. You know, as, <clears throat> as you know, rightly or wrongly, the Democratic Party has been accused by some of being mm -hmm. weak on defense, right. and uh, which is one reason why some uh, welcome Wesley Clark with right. his military credentials. Right. When, in your mind, should military force then be used? Oh, I think that uh, military force should be used uh, whenever uh, American lives uh, or American uh, interests are threatened in a significant fashion. Um, Let's take you know, Korea, and, and you talk about Korea in your policy statements on the right. web. Uh, our allies arguably and the American forces in South Korea are threatened by the right. North, but at what point would you, let's, let's just take that as one example. Right. We're not at war yet. Uh, how would, how would you handle something like that? Well, I think at the point that North Korea became a direct threat uh, to the American homeland uh, in a significant way, I think we would then be justified in engaging in serious negotiations with the threat of us engaging in military action. Uh, nobody wants North Korea pointing uh, nuclear silos at California. Uh, and keep in mind, you know, my, my grandfather... But, but would, you, would you, when you say the homeland, and I just want to make sure right. we're clear, would you limit it to the homeland, or what if as they did a few years ago, they, they sent a missile over, uh, uh, over Japan. What, what if the threat was to an American ally such as well, Japan? Well, look, we can't anticipate every situation. Sure. Uh, and I think that uh, we can, when we engage in policy, what we have to do is look at a set of broad principles. And we have to say to ourselves, um, how do we define our interests? Uh, at what points are we willing to intervene militarily? Or what, uh, at what point are we willing to intervene in a significant way uh, in which we are essentially declaring war on a country. Uh, and I think that circumstances are going to uh, change in each, in each uh, 
uh, time period, and it depends on the nature of the threat involved. Uh, if North Korea uh, develops one nuclear weapon uh, that does not have capability of reaching uh, the United States, then that probably dictates a different response than if they have missile silos pointed at us. Uh, and I think that in each of those circumstances, what we generally have to consider is that uh, given our strength, given our military strength, um, we can protect ourselves, uh, but what we also have to recognize is that as the globe shrinks and becomes more interdependent, that we have to uh, engage countries in the sort of regional dialogues that are currently taking place in North Korea um, with China and Japan and other countries to make sure that we are not alone in these uh, processes of containing direct threats. And uh, you know, the thing I've got to emphasize is, is I am by no means, uh, I think, a pacifist in this situation. Uh, you know, my grandfather fought in World War II uh, uh, in Patton's army, uh, and uh, I think is clearly an example of a war that had to be fought and justifiably uh, cost us uh, a lot in terms of blood and treasure, but was worth it in terms of creating the sort of world uh, that uh, was passed on to us by the greatest generation. But it's also important to note that that greatest generation built the institutions like the United Nations and, and uh, international norms and rules of law that ended up facilitating uh, our success over the last 50 years and got us through a Cold War uh, without us ever having to drop uh, another bomb. And, and I think that kind of marriage of diplomacy, military action, uh, is what's necessary and is what is lacking from the administration right now. Uh, while we could, I don't want to spend the entire interview talking sure. about foreign policy because it, you probably, I suspect, some of your strongest opinions are on domestic policy. Absolutely. L let's blend a little bit in something I think is more, uh, or certainly up your line of expertise with constitutional law. Right. Now that we are finding terrorism right. within the United States, how should we blend the protection of the homeland right. and civil rights? Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, we have a constitution that. Uh, makes a lot of those decisions for us. Uh, the Constitution says that um, we have separation of powers and we have power centers at, uh, uh, throughout the states and we have checks and balances and all those things are designed to make sure that individual freedom and liberty is preserved. Uh, obviously at times of war there are some areas in which those liberties may be restricted. Uh, when we are experiencing threats like we are with terrorism, which is not a conventional war, but uh, obviously threatens people potentially, uh, there may be areas in which we make modifications. But we have to keep in mind the core principles of the Constitution and civil liberties, and that's something I think this administration has failed to do. They passed uh, the Patriot Act. Would you have supported the Patriot no, Act? No, I would not have. And, and I think that the Patriot Act is a good example of um, fundamental principles being violated. And I'll give you some examples of things I would have supported after 9-11. Uh, uh, it used to be that you couldn't get a wiretap uh, on a roving phone. Uh, and that was because it used to be that all our phones were uh, located in a particular place uh, and you could get a warrant for that wiretap. Uh, that obviously doesn't make sense at a time when everybody's using cell phones. And so that was a necessary modification of the law that was incorporated into the Patriot Act. That provision I would have supported. On the other hand, you've got a whole host of provisions in which the executive branch, the Justice Department, can unilaterally um, go in without warrants and engage in searches without having first gone to a judge. And one of the basic principles that protects our civil liberties is we've got somebody watching the watchers, that we've got somebody uh, that John Ashcroft has to go to uh, to say, uh, look, I have a reason for suspicion. Uh, there's a reason why I want to look through Terry's emails. Here's my proof of, that there's probable cause. That basic principle, I think, has been violated. And I think beyond that, other than the Patriot Act, we also have had some disturbing practices in which the administration has uh, arrested people without due process, without them being able to access an attorney. Uh, and that basic principle uh, of habeas corpus, of being able to know what you're charged with, being able to get information uh, to mount a defense, has been violated in, in a, a troubling number of ways. And those are areas where I think the Democrats uh, need to stand up vigorously 
um, precisely because we don't, uh, you know, I, I think it was Ben Franklin who said that those who would uh, be willing to uh, trade uh, liberty for security usually end up with uh, neither. So uh, you know, we need to make some significant changes in that area. Uh, just the other day as we, as we uh, taped this, the, uh, the government released f uh, figures that the economy grew at 7.2 percent in the right. third quarter. Right. Um, one of the charges um, that I believe you made is that the Bush administration's economic policies are not working. Mm -hmm. Now the future will dictate more whether right. this continues or does not continue. Right. But what is your approach? <clears throat> uh, the Bush administration economic policies, I would say, have been if you would agree, predominantly uh, based on tax cuts. Well, I think solely, exclusively, and based on tax cuts. I don't know what other policies they have. What, what would your uh, approach, what do you think about tax cuts first to stimulate the economy, and then tell us what your, right. your basic approach is to uh, right. uh, building a strong economy? Well, I think a couple of things. The, uh, uh, I'm in, in favor of tax cuts as short-term stimulus if they're going into the pockets of working people that actually need them. Uh, here at the state level, I set up the Earned Income Tax Credit that's put $100 million in tax cuts into the pockets of people tip making $30,000 a year or less. Uh, and the reason I did that is because I recognize there are a lot of working families out here who are struggling every day and should not have to sustain the kinds of tax burdens that they're uh, experiencing. The problem with the Bush tax cuts were they offered no short-term stimulus. Uh, essentially, what they did was uh, uh, to provide enormous tax breaks to people who didn't need them, weren't even asking for them. You know, you've got Warren Buffett on Nightline explaining, I've got $36 billion, I don't need $370 million. I'm not going to spend it, I'll buy more Berkshire Hathaway stock. Uh, that kind of approach to tax cuts, I think, is uh, uh, patently irresponsible. And it's uh, resulted in us going from $200 billion to $500 billion, uh, uh, $200 billion surpluses to $500 billion deficits. Uh, at a time when we were given enormous demands made by the baby boom generation on the Medicare system uh, and the Social Security system. So uh, here's the upshot. I think that we, and most Americans, believe that government has a set of responsibilities and we should pay for them. We shouldn't be loading up debt onto our children and our grandchildren. We don't want more government than we need, uh, but we also recognize that there's significant needs out there that have to be met. What George Bush has essentially done is he's run up the credit card uh, to pay for tax breaks for people who are enormously wealthy, for the most part, and the consequences are going to be paid out over the next uh, decade by our children and our grandchildren. Uh, and that, I think, is not a good uh, basis for running an economy. You know, speaking of, of running up debt, one of the, uh, the, the trustees report on the Social Security uh, system shows that the system remains grossly out of balance in the long term. Right. Um, what would you do as far as addressing that? Everyone says there has to be reform. There have been effort reform, the Kerry Danforth committee hearings in 95. Right. Uh, some suggestions are to privatize or allow privatization, as Chile and some other nations have done. Uh, what would your approach be as far as addressing the, the long term fiscal imbalance in the Social Security right. system? Well, I wouldn't. Uh, uh uh, use Chile as a model of uh, the social safety net. Uh, that's one thing I wouldn't do. I think that uh, the first thing I would do is roll back uh, those tax cuts of George Bush's that uh, have resulted in the deficits that we're running because uh, those tax cuts, had we not engaged in them, uh, would be sufficient to stabilize Social Security for the next 75 years. Uh, that was an uh, enormous mistake. And I think that unless we reverse those, we're going to continue to have fiscal problems. Because keep in mind, in addition to Social Security, we have significant unmet needs here in Illinois uh, that we should be addressing. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. Uh, the health care crisis is real, and there is no reason why we cannot continue to expand programs like Kid Care, a program that uh, I expanded here to cover 20,000 more children. Uh, if the federal government is meeting its obligations in terms of the, the Medicaid match that it provides to the states. Uh, on the jobs front, uh, everywhere we're seeing manufacturing close up and uh, individuals are losing their jobs with very little help uh, in terms of retraining, very little help from the federal government to the states in terms of attracting uh, new growth industries. Uh, those are all areas in which we could be making investments and growing the economy effectively, but we can't do it if the federal government 
continues to engage in trickle-down economics in which essentially tax burdens are trickling down from the federal level down to the state level, down to the local level, so that people get a $300 tax break in the mail from George Bush and then end up paying $500 or $600 or $1,000 in higher property taxes, higher college tuitions, uh, and other uh, areas uh, that are vital to their lives. So we've got to change policy at the federal level to have an impact on a lot of these specific issues. What do you, uh, so let's touch base on some of these and we can <clears throat> move along to some of the, uh, maybe not spend as much time on some of these. Right. Just recently here uh, for the first time since Roe v. Wade, uh, the Congress has passed a limitation right. on abortion, the partial uh, birth abortion. What would, how would you have voted on that and what's your approach to uh, reproductive rights? Well, this actually, this, this issue came up at the state level. Uh, and I voted uh, uh, no on the, part, uh, on the late term abortion ban. Uh, not because I don't recognize that these are painful issues, but because I trust women to make these decisions. Uh, I think that uh, to the degree to which we presume as governments to make decisions in the most intimate, uh, basic, uh, decisions of uh, an individual's lives, I think we're making a mistake. Uh, and part of the reason that I voted uh, against the ban was because uh, as a constitutional law professor, I knew that without an exception for the mother's health, it would be struck down by the Supreme Court. And I said so at the time. Uh, I think two months after uh, it was passed here in Illinois, it was struck down by the federal court, went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court confirmed that in fact without uh, a uh, mother's health, health exception, it was unconstitutional. We'll see whether the court changes its mind uh, due to uh, uh, the fact that it was passed at, uh, at the federal level as opposed to at the state level. This might be a good time to insert that your, your legal credentials, um, you're a graduate of Columbia University right. and then you went to Harvard Law School and you were the right. first African American to be president of the Harvard Law Review. Right. What is it that you what does one do as president of the Harvard Law Review? Well, you know, you read a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, boring articles <laughs> <laughs> about, uh, about legal issues that are written by, uh, by uh, professors and judges all across the country. And it's a compilation of uh, ideas and, and uh, or cutting edge theory that uh, uh, lawyers are engaging in. Um, you know, I haven't read a law review article probably uh, in quite some time. Uh, but it, it was a great honor, and it gave me an opportunity, obviously, to, to think deeply about uh, issues that do ha end up having a significant impact on, uh, on all of our lives. Uh, and uh, it also, I think, prepares me well for a lot of the debates that are taking place uh, in Washington right now about judicial appointments, how we uh, approach issues of civil liberties, how we deal with uh, uh, a range of um, federal uh, problems that touch on uh, uh, our, uh, our legal system. And I wanted to ask you about that. With what's going on right now, uh, a number of the Bush appointees to the federal court are not getting through the Senate. Right. Uh, the Republicans are alleging that, that the uh, Democratic senators are, are making a supermajority and, right. and an unconstitutional approach by filibustering these. Right. What are your thoughts just on that yeah. process? Well, I don't have too much sympathy for uh, Republican grousing on this issue. Uh, it's, uh, George Bush has gotten three times as many of his federal judges in place as the Republicans allowed Bill Clinton to get in place uh, during the uh, eight years that he was in office. I do think that there's a legitimate problem in the Senate. Uh, we have such a bipartisan, bitter uh, contest in judicial appointments. And I think the way we resolve it is for all sides to take a deep breath, step back, and recognize that there are judges, both Republican and Democrat, conservative, uh, or liberal that are first-rate judges uh, who basically agree on the, the fundamental premises of our Constitution. And if the Bush administration appoints Republicans who are thoughtful, even though conservative, I think that Democrats, for the most part, have approved them. What the Democrats have objected to are uh, a number of ideological hacks that the George uh, Bush team have uh, come up with, essentially baiting the Democrats to say no. Uh, and that it, it, uh, kind of, uh, I think, gamesmanship in both the, uh, the appointment process as well as within the U.S. Senate is unfortunate because we don't have enough uh, uh, federal judges out there uh, for the, the volume of cases that they have. 
Do you think that, that both sides, uh, to follow up on that, I mean, just all, both sides ought to come together and, and change the process in some way so that a, a, we can avoid some of these partisan uh, turf wars? Well, uh, you know, the process is, is dictated by the Constitution. The Senate is supposed to advise and consent on these appointments. These are lifetime appointments. They're serious issues. Typically, this is one of those areas where presidents make decisions whose policies will extend beyond the life of their presidency. And so I think the Senate should take a hard, tough look at these decisions. I think that what you can do informally is simply to have the administration work with the Senate and work with, uh, uh, in this case, the Democratic Party, but the same is true when Bill Clinton was in office working with Republicans, to come up with consensus candidates uh, that obviously reflect the viewpoints and vision of the party that's in power, but also uh, are well enough within the mainstream of legal thinking that they're not going to kinds of red flags that uh, recent appointments have. Uh, before we <clears throat> run out of time entirely, just tell us your vision if you're elected. What kind of America would you like to see that's different from what we have today? Well, I, you know, I think that uh, uh, this country uh, is the greatest country on earth because of a, a, a basic vision that says we're all connected. Uh, you know, if there's a child uh, on the south side of Chicago who can't read, that makes a difference in my life even if it's not my child. Uh, if there's a senior citizen in downstate Illinois who's trying to struggle to pay for the prescription drugs, that matters to me even if it's not my grandparent. And, and I think that idea of, of mutual obligation uh, is, is at the core of the American idea and it's a, at the core of the Democratic Party. Uh, and I think that represents a fundamentally different vision. Um, and what that means, as I indicated earlier, is that uh, we don't want a government that is dominating us and sucking us dry, uh, but we want a government that reflects our core decency and our values. Uh, and so us providing uh, a decent start in the life of every child, even if they've been dealt a tough hand, and our ability to help individuals as they go along in life, even when they hit a bump in the road, I think is something that uh, separates us from most of the countries in the world, our ability to do that, our regard for each other. Uh, and that's the kind of uh, U.S. government that uh, I would like to be a part of building. And, and I think we have the basic structures there, but I think uh, they're fraying around the edges. They need a little uh, uh, refurbishing. All right. so. Senator Barack Obama, thank you for joining us on the Illinois Channel. Thank you. Great to be here. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel to gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. If you have any comments or questions on our programming, please email us at IllinoisChannel at AOL.com. Or if you have any questions about the Illinois Channel, please visit our website at www.illinoischannel.org.